Good morning. Good morning. There's a story told about a young man who went to train to go to the mission field. He was learning language, and he was the first day of language class went like this. The teacher came in at the beginning of class and started walking silently among the students. <coughs> Walked all around the class and then left the room. She came back into the room and then asked, did any of you notice anything in particular? There was a bit of silence. And then one student raised his hand and said, the only thing I noticed was you were wearing a nice perfume. And she said, that's exactly it. She said, some of you are preparing to go to China on the mission field. And it's going to be some time before you are able to speak the language, to communicate the gospel. But from the very beginning, you can share the aroma of Christ, even without words. would like to say she dismissed class at that point, but they had to get to work and learn the language. So it is with us. We don't always know everything. We don't always have all of the answers to the questions that come up to us from people at work or people in our community or people in our family. And whether we can share the gospel with words or not, we are all called to share the aroma of Christ wherever we go. Now, I don't know if any of you uh, noticed, I actually did put a little bit of spritz on before, uh, <laughs> before walking on. Now, I usually just save this for special occasions, if you know what I mean. Um, but Paul was talking, actually was writing, to some new Christians, some brand new Christians. In fact, the letter which we're going to look at this morning was the first letter written in the Old, sorry, in the New Testament. Anybody know what that earliest letter in the New Testament is? Any guesses? Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. If you wish to open up to that, we're going to look at how the Thessalonians, even though we, they were brand new Christians, they were shedding forth the aroma of Christ. And I'd like for us to start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He writes, Paul, Silas, and Timothy... It was great missionaries who brought the gospel to the Thessalonians, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. This was a customary greeting. This was a customary way that letters were begun in that period of time. You had the authors of the letter, you had the people to whom the letter is addressed. And notice this greeting, grace and peace. The Greek word for grace would be charis. The, uh, uh, one of the uh, immediate past, or one of the past ministers at Silver Spring uh, had a daughter named Charis which is grace. And something tells me that Derek McNamara, who was the minister at the time, 
and studied Greek. Well, I, I know he knew the Greek. And when you name your when you name one of your daughters after a Greek word, that that either means you're a real geek or you you think very highly of that term. Now, peace is a very Jewish word, shalom. Um, in Greek, it would be irene. So, charis and irene, grace and peace to you. And perhaps you remember in Russian, grace and peace is mir i blagodat. Actually, it, it's switched. Uh, mir i blagodat. Mir is peace. Maybe you've heard of the Mir spacecraft, the Mir, um, which is no longer there. But uh, Mir, so peace, and Blagodat, grace. So that is a very common greeting in the Russian uh, congregations. You will hear them say, Mir i Blagodat. So you would turn to your neighbor and shake their hand and say, Mir i Blagodat. Or you might give them a hug, Mir i Blagodat. So grace and peace to you. What a wonderful greeting. And what a wonderful way that we could greet each other. What if every time we met one another, either verbally or non-verbally, we, we wished them the blessing of God's grace and peace on them. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God the Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. From the very beginning, Paul is affirming what is happening in the church at Thessalonica. He's showing appreciation for what is happening to them. This church had experienced quite a bit of hardship, and Paul, along with uh, the others who were writing this letter were affirming them in what was happening. What does the fragrance of Christ look like? Well, it is a life that is characterized by faith, hope, and love. Paul talks about their work produced by faith. Their faith was at the basis of what they were doing. Who they were as Christians, how they had received the gospel, it prompted what they did. Their behavior was influenced by their beliefs that showed a great deal of life change that started from the inside out. Their labor was prompted by love. Their labor was prompted by a desire to give to one another, even as Christ had given of himself to them. And then their endurance was inspired by hope. If we have hope, we have the encouragement to go on. If we have hope, we say, okay, what I'm doing makes sense. What I'm doing is worth it. If we have hope, we will be encouraged to endure. Because we know that there is hope, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And Paul, by way of encouragement in this letter, was writing to them, encouraging them about their faith. And notice also, not only was uh, he writing words of thanks, but he was continually reminding them that he was praying for them. He was, that he was giving thanks to God, mentioning them in his prayers, and that he continually remembered them before God for all that they were doing. These are some things to think about as new Christians are added to our body. Are we encouraging them? Are we saying, yeah, Life can be hard sometimes. Yes, faith is difficult sometimes. But you're doing great based on what you know. We can acknowledge even the, the tiniest amount of growth. And this is what Paul is doing. He says, do you realize what you've done? He goes 
beyond what the aroma of Christ looks like to describing how it starts. We're going to look at three things today uh, with this idea of the fragrance of Christ. We're going to look at what it looks like, second, how it starts, and third, how it spreads. <coughs> so we've already looked at what, it, what does it look like? Well, the, the aroma of Christ, the fragrance of Christ, hallmarks of growing in Christ's likeness are full of faith, hope, and love. Are you growing in faith? Are you growing in love? Do you have hope? This is what it means to live the Christ-like life. Like, again, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Because Christ demonstrated his love for us by offering himself on our behalf. So if the hallmarks of Christ-likeness, the fragrance of Christ, are faith, hope, and love, how does it start? How does it start? Well, verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, Brothers, loved by God, we know that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. Think about the time when you became a Christian, if you are a Christian. How did the Word of God come to you? Now, you may have grown up in a Christian home. You may have heard the Word of God throughout your life. You may have had repeated opportunities to hear the message. But there, was, there came a time when the message got through, where it seemed to impact you deeply, where there was something that the teacher said, that your parents said, or maybe even the preacher said, that clicked, that made sense. I remember as a teenager, I had grown up going to church with my parents, the Presbyterian church. I had been baptized as an infant. I don't remember that. But I do remember growing up and hearing preaching, hearing scripture, and thinking about it as a child, then as a teenager. About the time I was a teenager, I, I was thinking, well, what do I believe? And so I started asking that question for myself, and I started my own search. I went to the church library. They had a pretty good church library at the Presbyterian church that I went to. But then I started listening to radio programs. Some of them were probably pretty good. Some of them were probably not very good. Um, and so I was on a search. I was looking for something. I was looking for my own faith. I was looking for hope. I think I was seeking love as well, but I didn't quite know where to find it. And I watched the Billy Graham Crusades, and I listened to the message that Billy Graham had to say, and I even called the number, and I even asked some hard questions of the people on the other end. I said, why would God send babies to hell? Because I, I had been hearing some fire and brimstone preachers, and I was unsettled. And I would come home, and I would listen to Christian radio, and I was a pretty serious teenager. I'm still pretty serious, but you didn't know how serious I was as a teenager. So I was pretty intense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but then, oh, well, I got a letter. And it, I, I still wish I knew where that letter was. And it basically said, it was after one of these Billy Graham crusades, and it, it was something like this. It said, we are so glad to hear of your interest in Jesus Christ. And we want to invite you to services at the Silver Spring Church of Christ. Now that's, now everybody said, well, the churches of Christ don't have anything to do with the Billy Graham Crusade. Well, that may not be. And so I wondered, well, well, maybe it was an angel who sent it to me and just disappeared. Maybe an angel just materialized a letter and... I ended up going there. Well, so I didn't have my driver's license at the time, so I started going to services 
in the evening. So I went with my parents to the Presbyterian Church in the morning, and then I went in the evening to the Church of Christ. <laughs> now I must say, when I, when I first went into the, the Church of Christ on an evening service, well, I think I've told you this story, well, Ted Thomas introduced himself to me, and then Earl and Tommy Ann West introduced themselves to me, but I noticed the preacher, who was Gary Selby, who's now a professor or head of a communications department at Pepperdine, he was preaching a sermon straight from the Bible. In fact, he was talking about the woman at the well. And, and I remember the sermon today that, that Jesus gave the woman at the well credit, compliments, and expressed confidence. That was the three points of the sermon. There was something about that sermon that was powerful. There was something about that sermon that was straight from the Bible. And that's what I was looking for. I wanted, I wanted the scriptures. I wanted to know what, what the scriptures said. But I also noticed that the, the church at Silver Spring, there was something about it, that they believed what the, the, the scriptures were saying and that they loved each other. There was a, a mother and a, a daughter, and, and the daughter put her head on the mother's shoulder and they embraced each other. And I thought, wow, that, that is so cool that, that they, they love each other. And... And, and so there, 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 was, there, was, there was something serious about it, but there were, uh, they, they seemed to be serious about their faith, but they also seemed serious about reaching out to others, and they, they offered to study with me. I mean, Earl West piled on books to me, which made my heart happy, and I studied with Gary, I studied with, uh, with Ted Thomas, and, and so forth and so on. But I, but I also remember at that period of time, there was something powerful. There, there, there was something, it was as if the Holy Spirit was moving in a powerful way at that time in my life. And, and I felt as if that was a time of accelerated spiritual growth for me. Now I happen to have with me my laminated New Testament, which was given to me back in the 80s. And in fact, after a period of time, I determined that I needed to be baptized by immersion. And I was serious enough about it, and I wanted to be sure it was done right, and I didn't want anybody to talk me out of it either. So I didn't even tell my parents that I was going to do this. I made a decision that I was going to go forward on a Sunday evening, and I was going to be baptized after you know, I was convinced that baptism by immersion was necessary. And so sure enough, the invitation was given, I went forward and I was baptized. And it happened on April 1st, 1984. So yes, I can say I was a fool for Christ's sake. And, and I, I, wrote it, I wrote it down here in the New Testament. I said, Eric Brandt baptized by immersion Sunday, April 1st, 1984, Silver Spring Church of Christ. And so this was the New Testament that they, that they gave me. So the word of God came with power. The Spirit moved, and it wasn't just words, but it came with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. And I think that's what happened in the Thessalonians, to the Thessalonians. Somehow the, the word came powerfully. He says, we know that he has chosen you because the gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. So that is how it starts. So what does it look like? How does it start? And then third, how does it spread? He says, you know, that, you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given in the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell us how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. And so how does it spread? Well, it says the Christian faith is modeled. 
says he became imitators of us and the Lord. We are told to make disciples of all nations. Well, what is a disciple? A disciple is a student. A disciple is somebody who imitates someone else, who takes on the characteristics of someone else. And so the way that they, the Thessalonians grew is they imitated the teachers until they knew enough to teach others. But they didn't just imitate their teachers, they imitated the Lord himself. And they did this, Paul says, in spite of severe suffering, that they, they welcomed the message with the joy of the Holy Spirit, and then they themselves became a model. It says they became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, so that the message was there. So the Lord's message rang, rang out from the Thessalonians to Macedonia, Achaia, and it, has, it says your faith in God is being made known everywhere. So they experienced dramatic life change, turning from idols to serve the living and true God. Even as some people turn from drugs and alcohol and crime to serve the living and true God. I know my time is just about up, but there are many, many great stories about life change that is happening. And I, I'll have to maybe blog about it or, or, or podcast about it or something. In fact, uh, Tim and I are starting to talk about how can we get some, some more of this information out. Because there's so much to share. There, there's not enough time to preach about it. I, I have some wonderful stories, for example, of the latest Christian Chronicle about congregations who are doing exactly this. They are serving in the name of the Lord. They are getting the word out, not, not just in word, but in deed. And they are shedding forth the fragrance of Christ in their communities. It, it's really quite amazing. So may, may God bless our congregation. May God bless us and our congregation to share the word. Now, some of us have been Christians a long time. This congregation has been here a lot longer than the Thessalonian, Thessalonian church had been there. Uh, so we have gifts, we have experience uh, that the Thessalonians didn't have. But maybe we need the example of a young church to encourage us to keep the faith and to spread forth the good news and not, not to uh, lose sight of all of the needs that are out there. Let's ask God's blessing on us as we go forward. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the example of the church at Thessalonica. We thank you how, even though they were a brand new church and faced a lot of suffering and a lot of difficulties, still they turned to you from idols to serve the living and true God. Help us to gain encouragement from how they were able to overcome despite severe hardship, and we do pray that you will give us wisdom and grace to know how you want us to reach out to the community, to preach the gospel with words, absolutely, but also with deeds and proven character, uh, so that people can sense the aroma of Christ in our lives. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I know there are lots of needs. I, I know... Um, each of us have our, our struggles, our trials, our difficulties, but, but I know that there is are, are a great deal of needs for prayer um, in this congregation, and I know we will have a closing prayer, and there will be opportunities for other special prayers. Uh, there are many prayers shared in uh, the bulletin, and, and let's certainly, even as Paul was faithful to pray for the Thessalonians, uh, we need to continue the labor of prayer as we pray for one another uh, and remember them before the Lord. So if there are any other special prayer requests, please feel free to make them known. And if the Word of God has somehow come with power in a new way, and if you have not become a Christian and you desire to be baptized, then the invitation is open. Whatever your need may be, please make it known as we stand and sing. I am resolved no longer.